Happy Sabbath and welcome to Upper Room Fellowship. We're so glad that you're joining us for worship today. We have a few announcements for you before we begin our service. First of all, next week, August 29, we have a special communion service. And what's so special about it is that we're going to be doing it together online. We'd like to invite you all to join us via Zoom for our communion service. And we're going to be partaking of the foot washing ceremony together, the partaking of the bread and the juice all together. So if you can go ahead and join us, then we'd love for you to connect with us at urf.org slash connect and click on the, the link of connecting with us and we'll give you the Zoom link there if you'd like to join us for our special live communion service next week. Now, if you don't want to join us live, but still would like to partake in the service, you're welcome to do so because we're still going to be posting it on our YouTube and our Facebook pages. So don't miss out. But we'd still love to see your faces as we join up together for communion service. On our newsletters, we've sent out the recipe for the communion bread and how you yourself can make it and also the types of juice and the other things that you need to prepare for to prepare for the uh, communion service. We have Sabbath school every single Saturday, adult Sabbath school and youth Sabbath school started, starting at 10.45 a.m. And we also have children's Sabbath school starting at 9.30 a.m. And these are all via Zoom. So we hope you join us for that and just continue to build our community here. Even though we're distant, we would still love to see your face. We have a Wednesday night prayer meeting that we want to invite all of you to join us in. We come together every Wednesday night starting at 745 for fellowship where we just come together and talk and see how we all are, how our weeks we're doing. And right at eight o'clock, we have a quick devotional and then straight into prayer. And most of it is just strictly bringing up praises and prayer requests to God and just coming together and praying about it. So we hope you join us for our Wednesday night prayer meeting um, every Wednesday at 745 p.m. via Zoom. Um, September 25, that's the first Sabbath in September, we are going to be having a youth-led worship and that means all of our youth are going to be participating in the program. They're going to be leading out in praise, they're going to be leading out in prayer and welcome and all the aspects of, of, of the service, now, except for the sermon, I'll be, I'll be uh, um, preaching that uh, Sabbath, but all other aspects, the youth and the children are going to be doing so. So we're going to ask parents if your child has any special music that they would love to share with our church and our online community, please go ahead and contact me. My phone number is 714-319-9432 and you can go ahead and let me know what special music you'd love for your children to share. And we welcome all, so we're hoping to get a big number of special musics for September 5 youth-led worship. Also. Starting in September, I'm going to be sending out a Google, um, Google worksheet to all the church members to ask for your help in participating in the worship service. We always need help with people doing the welcome. People who want to do special music, who want to do announcements, who would love to do um, garden of prayer. And there are many other different aspects of worship that we would love to have your help in. So I'm gonna be sending that out. And if you would be willing to fill it up and say which Sabbath you wanna participate in, go ahead and send that back to me and I'll know which Sabbath to contact you to be able to participate in our worship service. And finally, we want to continue to invite you to our Friday night Vespers. We just had one last night and we were so blessed to have discussion concerning a very important topic. And we're going over the book, The Great Controversy, and our lesson was Lesson 34, Can the Dead Speak to Us? That's a very important topic that in these last days, we really need to have clarity and assurance and truth on biblical truth. And so we hope more of you join us for our Friday night Bible studies and that uh, we'll be able to discuss these truths of God through the book, The Great Controversy. We're so glad that you joined us and you chose Upper Room as your church for this Sabbath. And we hope you continue to choose Upper Room uh, as your church for the Sabbath. We want to thank God for all of the families that are a part of our church. 
And as we always say here at, at, at Upper Room, at Upper Room, you are family. Welcome and happy Sabbath.
Number one, we've just begun. God should be first in your life. Number two, the auto windows gave him his heart nice. Number three, God's name to be never spoken in jest. Number four, the Sabbath for our worship and for rest. Number five, we all should try to honor Father and Mother. Number six, don't get your kids from killing one another. Number seven, life is heaven when you're true to your mates. Number eight, don't steal and break this rule for goodness sake. Number nine, don't leave behind who goes around telling lies. Number ten, don't covet when you see your name's house or wife. That's the list that God insists we stay away from these sins. That is why we memorize commandments one your ten. The perfect ten, the perfect ten. The just as true as they were way back when. God gave the perfect ten, the perfect ten. But say that once again. Number one, we just begun. God should be first in your life. Number two, the idol rules of grave and images are nice. Number three, God aimed to be. Number four, the Sabbath for our worship and for us. Number five, we all should try to honor Father and Mother. Number six, don't get your gift from killing one another. Number seven, life is heaven when you're true to your name. Number eight, don't steal and break this rule for goodness sake. Number nine, don't be behind who goes around telling lies. Number ten, don't covet when you see your neighbor's house or wife. That's the list that God intends to be stay away from these sins. That is why we memorize commandments one through ten. The perfect ten, the perfect ten. They're just as true as they were way back when. God gave the Happy Sabbath, church family. Before we begin, I'd like to ask if we could pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you will be with us, be with me as I speak. Father God, touch my lips, that you will purify me. May your presence be with all of us. Although we are separated by distance, may we be connected through you and open our hearts and minds to receive your message for us today. We pray these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. Today we are in the second part of our new sermon series entitled Endgame. Last week we learned that God's endgame is to give us a future and a hope. That we are sealed through the Holy Spirit for a guaranteed inheritance that God has wanted for us from the very beginning. And that even in the midst of sin, He had a plan of action to give us that inheritance, which is guaranteed through the Holy Spirit and sealed by Jesus Christ and His sacrifice. Today we're going to be talking about a very powerful gift from God. A very powerful gift from God that gives us a sense of what God's true endgame is all about. We are going to be talking about holiness. What is holiness? Sometimes we take holiness and we take it out of context. We think that holiness is something that is boring, something that is restrictive. We think of uptight people not having fun walking around in white robes and halos around their head. But in actuality, holiness is something so much more freeing and empowering that God wants us to understand the true context of what holiness is. Now, growing up, we were told different things were holy. For example, I grew up in the church, the Adventist church, and I was told at a very young age that the sanctuary that you walk in, the worship hall, is holy. 
Um, I was a Pathfinder, and for those of you that don't know what Pathfinders is, it's the Adventist form of Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. And as we got together in Pathfinders, there was the Pathfinder Law that we were to recite every single time we got together. And the Pathfinder Law said this, The Pathfinder Law is for me to do my honest part, care for my body, keep a level eye, be courteous and obedient, walk softly in the sanctuary, keep a song in my heart, and go on God's errands. These principles are really good to follow, but taken out of context is sometimes how we can take the original meaning of God's holiness and what it truly is. What do I mean by this? The sanctuary. Don't get me wrong, it is a place and it is a very important place, but the sanctuary is not a holy place. We do need to be respectful when we go in there. We do need to be worshipful when we do that. But we have to keep in mind that it is just a building. The only reason why the sanctuary becomes holy is when God's presence is in that place, setting that place apart. And honestly, we have learned over the past six months that as Christians, followers of God, we do not need a building or a church or a sanctuary to worship God and have His presence, His holy presence with us. God is in the midst of His people and His holiness is where their hearts are when they are motivated towards God to invite Him into their very presence, into their very place and be transformed by Him and His holiness. For our passage for today, we're going to be looking at Peter and actually other uh, passages in the Bible, but specifically um, our, our scripture for today is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. The Word of God says this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, Keep that in mind. I want you to remember that phrase. And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Now, as we look at this passage, Peter, who is the author of this book, is writing to his audience to be holy. This is in stark contrast to their former lives when they were ignorant of who God actually was. Now, in the midst of difficult times, because you, if you remember, they, the, the people back then were going through difficult times. They were being persecuted. They were tempted to go back to the way they were, their sinful lusts, the way they used to um, just allow culture to roll all over them. But what Peter is saying here in this passage is to remind them, is to charge them, is to let them know that need, they need to change their lives to be holy and live differently because the one who calls them is holy in and of himself, and that is God. And that is a concept that we need to understand. God is holy in and of himself. And so in the presence of God, that's where holiness is. Ellen White she says in Acts of, the, um, Acts of the Apostles, page 518, The apostles sought to teach the believers how important it is to keep a mind from wandering to forbidden themes or from spending its energies on trifling subjects. Those who fall prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. What Ellen White is saying in this uh, quote is that the concept of holiness comes with the idea of purity and impurity, meaning that our actions have effect on our purity to God. And in the Old Testament, one could not come to God and His very holy presence without being purified first. Now, some of the earliest encounters of God's holiness with human impurity are found in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses is tending his sheep in the hills of Midian. These are his father-in-law sheep. And as he is tending his sheep off in the distance, he sees something very interesting. 
As he goes to investigate, he sees a bush that is burning but is not consumed or burned up. Now, if I saw something like that, I think any of us would want to kind of go check it out. Why is this bush burning but not getting burnt up? What is, what is so uh, special about this? As Moses gets closer to investigate, a voice from the bush says, Do not come near. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. Now, sometimes we just bypass this, but why was that place that Moses is standing on holy ground? Because the very presence of God was in that place. Now, the presence of God was also in another place. We see this in the Hebrew sanctuary we found, uh, that can be found and described in Exodus chapter 20 through 40. The Hebrew sanctuary where we had the outer court and then the temple, the holy place and the most holy place. The holy place was where it was said that the presence of God resided on. And you can see that described in Exodus um, chapters 20 to 40, where the pillar of smoke was residing over the most holy place that represented God's presence. And also the pillar of fire by night represented God's presence. And so the Israelites knew God's presence was there at all times because it was physically represented. Now, what happens when it's not necessarily physically represented? In, later in Exodus chapter 34, in between these, Moses goes up on the mountain and he is in the very presence of God. He is in the very presence of God becoming purified and holy. And when he comes down the mountain, his face is so radiant from being in the presence of God that the Israelites ask to cover his face because it's just too much for them to handle. Right? Something is too much for them to handle. You usually want to cover it. You want to put it out of your presence. But this is what happened. When we are in the presence of God, He purifies us. He makes us holy because of His presence. And in so doing, people will see the presence of God and be changed by it. This is where we get the phrase mountaintop experience from, very, from Moses' very experience with God. Now, another place that we see God's presence purifying and making um, people change is in Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has a vision that he is in the throne room of God and he sees God in all of his glory. In Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 7, it says this, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood a seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And this is um, Isaiah speaking in verse 5. And I said, Woe! is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And if you remember back in verse 3, the Lord of hosts is holy, holy, holy. Verse 6 says this, Later, um, um, then one of the seraphims flew to me, having in his hand a coal burning that was taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. That is a very important passage. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Because in the presence, the full presence of God, Isaiah says, I am lost. In other translations, he says, I am undone. I am ruined. You see, in the very presence of God, there's a stark difference of God's perfect holiness and our impurity, our sinfulness. It's too much for us to handle. Now, amazingly enough, it was even too much for these two amazing men of faith to handle, Moses and Isaiah. But rather than being fully destroyed, ruined, or undone, God takes that which is impure, these two impure men, and make them pure and holy through His own holiness, purity, and His presence. You see, in the Old Testament, 
the Old Testament book of Leviticus, the Hebrew people were to refrain from touching anything that had to do with death. For example, sickness and disease. They were not to touch any of those sicknesses. They actually had to quarantine themselves, the sick person. Sound familiar? They had to quarantine themselves not to infect the rest of the camp. Now, they were not also to touch dead carcasses. They were not even supposed to touch even bo certain bodily fluids, lest they make themselves both impure physically and ritualistically. This was the practice that was done in the sanctuary of the Old Testament. The high priest, the high priests were not allowed even into the sanctuary unless they purified themselves. He would go ask for forgiveness of his sins and physically wash himself. And you were never to come into the presence of God in, in an impure state because the results many times we've seen from the Bible is death. But what was that death from the from God killing them or from the presence of God being so pure and their impurity not working out? Well, maybe they weren't ready. The Bible reveals to us when people are ready to meet God and want to meet God and have a sense of wanting to be purified and holy in His presence, then God shows him His true holiness and what He wants to imbue to them. We see this through the experience of Moses. Moses was in the presence of God at the burning bush. Isaiah was in the presence of God and they both wanted to hide their face. They both wanted to feel like they were undone, but God purified them in his presence and made them holy. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 7 reveals that after Isaiah's lips were touched with the coal from the altar, it says your guilt is taken away and your sins atoned for. God made Isaiah pure. God made Moses pure and holy in his sight with his presence. We become holy when we are purified by God and His very presence. And this concept became flesh when Jesus came onto the scene. It's a very powerful thing. Like I said before, in the Hebrew culture back in the days, you were refrained to touch, touching anything impure, lest you transfer that impurity, both physical, the physical impurity, maybe it's sickness or some fluid or whatever, or a, a diseased carcass, or ritualistically, and you would transfer that to yourself the impurity but what Jesus did throughout his entire ministry was to flip that thinking on its head and we need to start flipping our thinking about holiness and what truly is holy and what makes things holy because Jesus went around touching lepers healing the blind healing the uh, blessing the poor bless uh, healing the sick um, um, let, uh, saving the demon-possessed man and making those feel ostracized from society like they counted. He went and touched all of these people, all that society deemed impure, and instead of transferring that impurity to himself, Jesus made these people whole, holy, and pure with his very presence and with his very purity. That is why Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says this, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and life more abundantly. The thief is Satan who deems to deceive us to think that holiness is boring. Holiness is restrictive. Holiness is unattainable and that when we are impure we are not able to come to God because God will destroy us. Am I right? And so this makes us think that we can never come to God because we will never be pure. But what God is trying to teach us here is that God is the one who makes us pure, who makes us holy, and who changes our life to have life more abundantly. If we come back to our passage, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, this is what Peter is saying, and I'm going to be paraphrasing just a little bit. Verse 13, he says, let's get ready to work, work for the Lord. Don't make yourself impure by your former life of sin or try to think that you can make yourself holy by your own efforts. And don't even stay impure by staying away from God, thinking that He will never take you. In order for us to become holy, we must go 
to God himself. And God will purify us and make us holy with his very presence dwelling in us. In preparing for today's sermon, I asked myself, what does holiness have to do with our current situation? How does holiness affect me now in this pandemic, in this stay at home order, how we're all separated? What, what is going on here? What is my role? What is the role of holiness? And I had to be brought back to the Bible. The Bible revealed this. Moses, who was impure, was purified by coming into the presence of God. And as he was brought into the presence of God, he was sent then to sa save and rescue the Israelites. Isaiah, who was impure, was purified by God and His holy presence and later sent to represent God to, to His people, to those surrounding nations. The disciples who were deemed by society as impure not fit to be rabbis or teachers or people of uh, a, a, a disciple of a rabbi themselves were purified by Jesus and his presence in them and sent out to spread the good news. All the lame, sick, poor, blind, demon possessed, disenfranchised people were purified by Jesus, were healed, who were forgiven. And in doing so, they were sent, then sent out to spread the good news. Now, all the while, they were coming to Jesus in their impurity to be cleansed and made whole by God's very presence in their life. Holiness is a gift from God for us to use that our energies can be pointed to function properly. Now, Hopefully you're not taking this out of context and saying, well, you can come to God in any state. If you don't want to even be changed, if you're impure and you're still in a sinful life and you don't want to change and you go to God, He'll change you. No, you need to come to God recognizing your sin, realizing that we are impure and wanting to be changed so that when you finally get into the presence of God, God's presence will not make you undone because if you have that wrong attitude, then you will be undone. But if you have the attitude of knowing that the presence of God does purify you and change you, then in the presence it can be freeing and invigorating, right? Holiness is a gift from God, like I said earlier, so that we can focus our energies to be pointed in the right functionality. He is not looking, God is not looking to extinguish our joy by making us think that we have to be prim and proper holy saints with um, halos around our head. Rather, He wants to set ablaze our joy in the right context. Christ wants us to bring to Him our depression, our stress, our anxiety, our fear, our sins, right here and right now because in doing so the very presence of god is imbued in us to live a life and a life more abundantly in order to shine god's light to others the whole point of god's end game is not only to just save us from sin but in turn that when we receive the power and the inheritance and the sealing of the Holy Spirit, we are able to live a life that is able to impress others. D.L. Moody, who was a former uh, or who was a, a pastor uh, many years ago, may, said this comment A holy life will make the deepest impression. Lighthouses blow no horns, they just shine. Brothers and sisters, in this pandemic, Holiness is so important and key because for us to be holy, we need to be pure. And for us to be pure, we need to take our sinful nature with a, 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 a contrite heart, a heart willing to be changed by God so that He can change us to becoming, uh, to bec becoming a light for others. He will take our depression and our stress and our anxiety and our fears and our sins and give us a right perspective with him when we are made holy in the presence of god and god is in our presence it is transforming 
If it is not transforming, brothers and sisters, then we are not in the right space. We are not in the right mind. And that holy presence of God will only seem like we are unfit to be there. When God, all He wants, His end game is to make us more in His presence, more holy like Him. May we seek to find God's true holiness, not through our own acts of trying to become holy, but by inviting the very presence of God into our hearts. May our perspectives change by the ever transforming power of God's holiness in the midst of our trials so that we can become lights to others, revealing the path of restoration, transformation, and wholeness to them. God's holiness is powerful. And my prayer is that you will seek to invite God's presence in you, to make you purified, to make you holy, to make you more like Him. God's end game is so that you can live a life and a life more abundantly, and that we can live forever in eternity with Him. Let's pray. Gracious Father, You are truly amazing. And sometimes we do wonder about some of these theological words like holiness. Only You are holy, Father God. But You want us to be holy, and Your desire is so that we will have Your presence in us, purifying us and changing us. We invite You to be in our very place so that the ground we walk on, Lord, is filled with Your presence of holiness. And so that when we are in Your presence, just like Moses was up on the mountain, we will come down from that mountaintop experience every single day to shine Your light to others. Father God, shine in us. Father God, I pray that your presence be in all of those that are struggling through this difficult time. Some are asking for healing. Some are asking for um, happiness in depression. Some are asking for peace in the stress. Some are asking for forgiveness of sin. Some are asking for a, a restoration of marriage and relationships with others. Some are asking for financial help. May your presence fill them and give them a perspective that you, you have a hope and a future for the life. Father God, thank you for being such an amazing God. We pray all these things in our loving Savior's name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us, and may God bless you. Happy Sabbath.